All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Hope Fellowship. Thank you for those that have joined us in person today. Um, almost maxed out for how we're allowed to space out people, uh, at least those that have registered. I think there's a couple more to come. But uh, thank you for joining us online. I see the comments are coming in. This is going to be fun. Um, and I'm going to get into some fun announcements because there's a lot going on. Today is October 31st, which is what? All Hallows Eve. Very good. They said Halloween, I know, but yes. So here we go. Let's, uh, scariest pumpkins ever. The Wi-Fi's out, battery is low, student loans, and check engine light. There we go. And then, of course, uh, stop coming up and saying trick or treat. I said I have 95 theses, not 95 Reese's. So this is a Reformation Sunday, which is really important. And uh, some of you that have met Pastor Hans before he retired, he's here today. And uh, he had the red mask on because you're supposed to wear red. I didn't know that. And then he had special socks on um, for Reformation Sunday that said something like, here I stand, I can stand no more, whatever, whatever that phrase is. I don't know it. But uh, he showed us on the socks. So he's pretty excited about <laughs> Reformation Sunday. And we're going to talk about that briefly today because it's more important than you think. Um, celebrations. Tasha, uh, happy birthday on November 4th. Ron and Sharon, happy anniversary to you guys. I think you're watching. We'll check in a few minutes. Uh, and then we have uh, Carol Franco. If you're watching, Carol, welcome back to University Gates. She was in the hospital for about a week and a half, and so good to see her recover. Uh, we missed you, and we care about you. Okay, this is a sad one. So, I had the honor and privilege of driving David and Melissa and Elijah and Snow, that's Snow's in that crate, <laughs> uh, to the airport yesterday. Uh, they literally, they sold their, their crib and their change table for pickup on Saturday morning. Like, I, Melissa's probably one of the most organized people I've ever met, and she organized their move. So they're going to Alberta to be with his dad and uh, the other side of the family. And then they're uh, flying back to Toronto and directly down to Brazil um, when they're done. So I think it's a couple weeks. But they're, they've just moved. This is their final picture as they're about to board the plane. And so David and Melissa, safe travels. Uh, they have arrived in Edmonton safely. Everything's good. But uh, we're going to sure miss them. But they plan on coming back in a couple years, uh, especially when Elijah's ready to enter the school system here. So that's what their hope is. So just uh, they're coming back. Um, don't forget to pre-register online. Thank you. You guys are getting better at this, um, except for one. But anyway, we're getting better at um, signing up to pre-register for, for uh, coming here on Sunday mornings. Um, it's a thrill to, to have you guys do that. So you got to 5 o'clock every Saturday. Next, financial support. Um, I'm saying thank you an awful lot, but I'm also wanting to encourage the Hope Fellowship family and anybody that values who we are and what we do to consider, you know, the regular financial needs of the church. Because um, even though grace is free, the gospel is free, but it takes money to get out. We've heard that line before. But it really does. We still have, we have not stopped as a church since COVID began. Uh, sometimes people think, well, I'm not going anymore, so I don't need to because there's nothing happening. But we're still paying rent. We're still, you know, salary, sorry. But all that stuff, like, it, it still costs. So don't forget about us. And uh, um, you can do it online, or you can, we have a basket over here for envelopes for those that would like to. But just, just a heads up. Uh, daylight saving next Sunday. So don't forget to fall back. So back. That means get an extra hour. Yes, this is the better one. Springs kind of yuck because you lose an hour, but now we just got it back. So what are you going to do with your hour? Sleep. All right. Uh, no after church Zoom today. Sorry. Um, just a heads up for those that were thinking about it. I never got an email out either, so ha ha. Um, something else to draw your attention to. I have not talked about this for a long, long time, but every single Wednesday morning at 8 a.m., I stream a podcast vlog called Still Growing in Grace. Um, when I was with Grace Walk, we were, weren't doing anything like this. But then when we changed to Growing Grace Ministries Canada, uh, we started doing the radio show on Faith FM and the online. So this past Wednesday, we hit our 100th episode, which is really cool. Like, it is neat to see, like, what? We're already there. But the topics are dealing with some pretty heavy-duty stuff, which I'm going to talk about uh, in a few minutes. But... Consider watching. You don't have to watch live because it's 8 a.m., um, but it's on the same YouTube channel 
uh, as what you see in the links below uh, in the description for today's video. So it's all in the same playlist or same, uh, you'll see it's called Still Growing Grace is the playlist. But uh, join in, there's some really good topics in this week's that we just did and next week's are really good and I'll explain why. And it fits Reformation Sunday. I didn't realize that until last night. I went, oh my goodness, it's all tied together. Uh, commenting on Facebook. So let's say hello to see who's watching. We've got a bunch. Uh, Howard in Sorrento, British Columbia. Good morning. It's early for you. I know it is. Uh, Rod and Gail from Kitchener. Good morning. Nancy Jenks. Yoo-hoo! In Waterloo from the fourth floor. Uh, I think it is. Uh, Dan and Alan, good morning. Ron and Sharon, uh, happy anniversary if you didn't see that. Uh, at least, uh, hopefully I got my date right, but there we go. Uh, Pete, hey, Pete, there we go. Uh, Wayne and Jackie in Kitchener, good morning. Val, good morning. Uh-oh, hey, hey, whoa, don't do that. Oh, no, 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 oh, good. All right, ah, no, sorry, tech. <sighs> All right, um, Debbie and Jerry in New Hamburg, good morning. Great seeing you there. Alex and Karen in Ottawa, good morning. Uh, Chris from, get this, uh, Palm Lake, South Africa. Holy smokes. What time is it, Chris? Are you like, is it late or early? But wow, thanks for joining in and, and uh, checking out Hope Fellowship and who we are and what we're about. Becky McKay, good morning. Wayne and Becky. Uh, Drew, good morning from the third row. Rod and Gail, um, yep, he's already saying hi. And then um, Abram. And Clausen from, I believe it's Manitoba. Yes, I'm pretty sure. And then Ken and Francis in St. Jacobs. Yes, so far away. Ken, buddy, my buddy Ken. Hey, good morning, bud. Great seeing you online. All right, let's keep rolling. Worship. Um, we're not doing a kid's story today. Uh, I notice they're distracted all the time anyway. <laughs> but they're even more distracted today. So that's wonderful. And uh, we're just going to do a couple songs. Uh, Terrell and Leah and Russ and Jen. If her, oops, I just realized that. Shh, don't tell her. And uh, yeah, let's, let's just take these songs in and let's see how the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts. Here we go. Good morning, Hope Fellowship. Hello. Uh, Leah and I are going to sing a couple songs for you and with you, hopefully. Hopefully you can sing along from home. Um, the first song we're going to sing is You Make Me Brave, uh, the Bethel Kids version, because uh, we have a kid. Uh, so we'll sort of do uh, this song uh, together. Uh, I think it's a neat time uh, to sing this song. Just uh, sometimes I think we may need a little bit of bravery and courage um, during these sort of weird and uncertain times. Um, so hopefully this is an encouragement to us all this morning.
This version of Great is Thy Faithfulness uh, was first arranged by a youth leader of mine in high school, Annette Lougheed. Um, I had the privilege of taking it with me to Briarcrest and rearranging it and recording it with some uh, classmates there. Uh, we hope you enjoy it. Great is Thy Faithfulness. first song, Oceans, some of us needed to feel the love of God poured out on us wave after wave. People are going through difficult stresses. They have been for a while, but sometimes we just let the, gotta let the love of God just kind of pour over us. 
And it doesn't have to sound religious. It can be through kindness. It can be through a great cup of coffee, something. <laughs> My goodness. And then love that version of Great is Thy Faithfulness. That, that was really cool. Just to listen and still see the words of the old traditional hymn. And then, uh, yeah, I loved it. I hope you enjoyed it as well. All right. Let's get started. This is going to be an ADHD sermon all over the place. <laughs> Just the way it's going to be. Look, a squirrel. No, a ball. Right. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So, Reformation Sunday today. What's so important about it? And uh, in my tradition, my background, it was not celebrated. We didn't know anything about Martin Luther, really. Um, we were just good old Baptists, and, you know, we had our own tunnel vision. <laughs> that's it. That's all we knew. And so to realize there's more going on in the world and the, the history of our faith is wider and bigger than we think uh, is pretty cool. So this little Lego guy, or not Lego, is it Lego? Oh, pl Playmobil. Oh, I better get that right. Yes, because I got in serious trouble one year for calling it Lego, and it's not. So that Playmobil Martin Luther, uh, one of my buddies online posted that, but Pastor Hans had one in his office all the time too, the same little guy. So it's kind of cool just to remember who Martin Luther was and what he did. Um, th no, the door was fine. I'm just fixing your theology. So this is where he's putting his 95 theses, his arguments against the church on the Wittenberg door. Nailed it on there and started a big fight. Uh, he was a uh, Catholic uh, individual studying, and uh, he said, hang on, there's some inconsistencies here. There's some stuff wrong, and he challenges it. So if you read all 95, I saw some duplicates a little bit as you, as you go through, but it's worth reading. Because of this, you are experiencing the freedom of your denomination and church. The, it goes back to this. He's the spearhead of it. It wasn't just him, but he's, he's the poster boy for the Reformation, for the changes to reform our thinking, reform our theology, to expand and grow deeper. And he's not given enough uh, credit, and we get, it gets kind of washed under the, under the bridge with Halloween, with trick-or-treat. And yet, if you look for it, oh my goodness, you'll find it. There are some really good articles on the, the, the value of what is All Hallows' Eve, there's, there's something powerful about that, and that the, the darkness comes, but day comes in the morning. There's, it's the journey of hope. It doesn't have to be all, oh, it's so evil-focused. Oh, stop it. You know, Jesus took care of it already, so chill. Quit giving more power and, and feeding what I call the, I'll, be, I'll, I'll use nice terminology, the garbage. <clears throat> um, but I tell you, it's, here's, here's a prayer from the Anglican common, uh, Book of Common Prayer from 1662. That's a long time ago. This is a perfect Halloween prayer. Somebody posted that this morning, I saw it. So I, even this morning, I'm adjusting and changing. Oh my goodness, I get, how am I going to fit this in? And I'm not even getting to my topic yet. But yet it's connected. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to give us grace to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. So, this is a prayer for all saints' day, which is tomorrow, remembering the saints who've gone before us. That doesn't just mean some big names that were given sainthood by a person with a tall hat, this has to do with those of us who've lost our loved ones too, to remember them. This is like the, the family of faith remembering, like Carol Brooks, a saint who's gone on. We remember her on this All Hallows' Eve and tomorrow. In fact, uh, I was just talking to a few of you this morning about trying to find a way to have a quick graveside time uh, at Carol's grave. I'm going to talk to Dave and make sure that's okay with him. Uh, I'm sure it is, but still want to make sure. But this idea from 1662, Halloween's more than we were told. So I read those scary comic books. I read all those scare that crap out of you books and articles on how evil it all is and all that. And we grew up with that. But my goodness, I focus on the light. That's what it's for, all hallow, all holy evening. Okay, the evening before All Saints Day. So my goodness, I think it's time to sh do some shifting. With this, I'm going to do a devotional of hope from Henry Nouwen. It's really short, but it's still really good. Hope at all times. And it fits. Hope fellowship. Ha, <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> it is central in the biblical tradition that God's love for his people should not be forgotten. It should remain with us in the present when everything is dark, when we are surrounded by despairing voices, when we do not see any exits. Then we can find salvation in our remembered love, a love that is not simply a wistful recollection of a bygone past, but a living force that sustains us in the present. Through memory, love transcends the limits of time and offers hope at any moment of our lives. This is how we should handle Halloween. Not looking at the fearful stuff, but finding hope and light in the darkness. Oh my goodness. So where are we going with this? I haven't even started my sermon yet. <laughs> but this is how it rolls. Uh, we're actually going to gonna like this. This is kind of interesting. Someone posted this, so it's not mine. So you know how Protestants celebrate Reformation Day when Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis to the door of the church in Wittenberg? I think we need something like this for the deconstructing Christians. Like the date the book Love Wins by Rob Bell came out for something. <laughs> I thought, that's, that's interesting. It made me ponder because that book really ticked off a lot of people. So did the shack. So if a book ticks off the religious church, it's going to be a good one. <laughs> okay. When they tell you don't read it, ha, they're feeding the read. I love it. But here's something really interesting. It was Martin Luther who was deconstructing, if you're going to use that word. By the way, deconstruction is just a, a modern term for discipleship. Growing, learning, growing up and maturing in Christ. That's all it is. Because as a child, you believe certain things. Then you get a little older and go, oh, I didn't hear it like that. That's, that's incorrect. to replace it with truth or better truth or more truth. And you mature and mature and mature. That's what happened with Martin Luther. That's why books like Rob Bell's book, Love Wins, which is a phenomenal book, by the way. All right? Some people say, well, he's, he's like talking anti-hell. He's asking questions that have been pondered by all of us anyway. And now he's asking the questions that nobody is willing to say out loud. And that really launched the permission for more and more people to, hey, I got questions too. Because we've been fed all these answers throughout our church history, but never allowed to question them. And now I'm questioning a lot of the answers. And I'm finding more hope. I'm finding that and anything's on the table for questioning. We're not, truth can stand up for itself. It doesn't need defending. But, oh, no, they're going to see God wrong. Really? Who's in charge of your revelation of God? God is. He can handle it. He'll let you on your journey, even if the pendulum swings all over the place, which is the Still Growing Grace episode this week. What happens when our pendulums tend to swing too far? Well, now we're really, we're going to lose our faith. We're going to deconstruct Jesus completely. You know, people do that. They, they think, well, then there is no God, and they stop being Christian, so to speak, and all these terms that happen. And we're afraid of that, are we? It sounds scary, but listen, once you're steeped in something so deep and you're only living by mommy and daddy's faith or your church's faith, there's a problem there. You need your faith. And it took me a long time. And finally, when I went to Bible college, I had to move on from mommy and daddy's faith, which had many good roots. There's nothing wrong with it. But... I had to discover mine, and that means I had to peel back layers and question things. And I had a wonderful professor, um, Glenn Boyce. Um, he ticked me off because he didn't let me get away with being lazy. Because um, <laughs> that's kind of what happened. And uh, he questioned us. We had all these churchy kids in his class. And, you know, he asked a question, and hands went up, and they answered their Sunday school typical answer. And then he yelled back, Why? That's the, don't ask why, it just is. He's trying to teach us to think. And that was the best gift he gave to his students. And he's still a really good guy. I tell you, Martin Luther, while he deconstructed and gave us the Reformation with the 95 Theses, it was the permission to keep exploring. The more I unlearn, the more I find God's love is bigger and wider than I've been told. Not the opposite. I was afraid of losing faith. I thought, oh no, 
Am I going to just walk away from everything I've believed and practiced? But no, Jesus is real to me. The centrality of Christ becomes, I think that's, that's really the pinnacle point. My friend Ken, who said hello this morning, he came to a point in his life and he taught me something. He really did. He didn't know what to believe anymore because of a crisis he was in. He said, I don't know what I believe. I, I just I give it all away. And then, then he said, no, wait, just Jesus. Just Jesus. That's all I got. It's all I can handle right now is just Jesus. There's something to that. To start again with just Jesus and, and all the doctrines that we've learned. And there's nothing wrong with the do- those doctrines. They're all incomplete anyway. So don't be afraid of that. But sometimes they're also influenced by people and you're told what to interpret. Which is why I'm doing this series I am. And I'll explain that in a minute. Other people's spiritual journey looks like a wonderful Facebook, look at me, right? But the real journey is, ah, it's scary. <laughs> and some people don't want to do this because they're, they're afraid of that. They're afraid of, uh, of this because here, uncertainty is challenged. Certainty is probably the problem. In that whole Still Growing Grace series, right from the beginning till episode 100 and next week as well. It is the journey of deconstruction, reconstruction, challenging, questioning, exploring, interviewing others who have perspectives because none of us have all the answers. And to hear somebody else actually question something you've been pondering and them being honest and walking through it and still not lose their faith, oh my goodness. Reformation! Somebody encouraged me this morning, John Crotty. He watches from Texas, and his wife has been battling cancer, and I believe she's cancer-free now. But he, he said, I, I, I pray this over you. Philippians 1.9. I had to look it up. <laughs> I don't have it memorized. And so I'm going to share with you his blessing from Texas to all of you here watching from three different translations. And it, to me, this is the foundation When I send my voice to the Great Spirit, I pray the love you have for each other will grow strong and remain steady in wisdom and understanding. That's interesting. That's the uh, First Nations version. Now a more familiar one's coming. The Passion Translation says, I continue to pray for your love to grow and increase beyond measure, bringing you into the rich revelations of spiritual insight in all things. This is what Hope Fellowship is for. It has been that since I've been here. It started before I arrived. That we encourage each other. Some of us are asking, why do we do church anymore? I saw some stats recently that, oh, church attendance is dropping. Oh, no. From 2000, it's just like a ridiculous reduced rate. The church is dying. Church isn't dying. The attendance of buildings probably is. But the church is not dying. And if, if I can be bold, as long as I'm here and you'll let me be your pastor, I want to keep pointing you to look to Jesus. I want you to find the hope to keep growing in wisdom and knowledge. That's what we're about. And the kids are learning this too. We don't have all the programs. We don't look like those big churches that can do all the, the bling and glare. I would love that. Sometimes I thought, man, can we just merge over with this other church? I don't have to worry about all that. <laughs> I don't think the message would be quite the same. We offer yet another spoke in the wheel. Other churches offer different spokes. They're not wrong. They're on their journey where they're at. So be careful that we don't spit at each other. (laughs) Hence, 45,000 different denominations. They can't all be wrong, can they? (laughs) Let's read this from Eugene Peterson's The Message. This is the blessing from John Crotty to us. I love this because I think it fits who we are as a church. If you're wondering why are we even meeting, may this inspire you. It's not about doing. So this is my prayer, that your love will flourish. There it is. And that you will not only love much, but well Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head 
and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. <laughs> Live a lover's life, circumspect and exemplary. A life Jesus will be proud of. Bountiful in fruits from the soul, making Jesus Christ attractive to some. Oh, no, it says all. Getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God. John Crotty, thank you for that blessing. Last week. Last week we, I'm just going to do a quick recap of a couple highlights I'm not going to go through all the verses again, but there were a few that really hit home that I want you to remember. This idea of questioning, the idea of growing in knowledge. How many times have you read a scripture, especially if you're well church, and suddenly, what? I never saw that before, but it's been there the whole time. That to me, that's called revelation. <laughs> and once you see it, it's really hard to unsee it. It's easy to forget, but it's hard to unsee it once the revelation comes. So who is this Jesus? If we want to have the centrality of Christ as our key motive, Jesus is the centerpiece of all that I believe. He's the light of men and women. That's not a gender issue. But in him was life, and the life was the light of all humanity. <laughs> I love it. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The light is in all. Why is that scary? Well, my church said the light only comes in when you say a prayer. Well, that's not what Scripture says. Which one are you going to believe? I'm sorry, read it yourself. I'm not making this up. That's what last week and today and probably next week is going to be. I'm showing you where to look for yourself. So you can see, oh my goodness, it does say that. Making Jesus even bigger and better. Matthew 6, 23 and 22, sorry, 6, 22 and 23. I did not read this last week. And it's in the list to read later, but it fits with what I just said, that the light is in all. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Here it is. If then the light... That is in you is darkness. If, so if that light that is in you, if that's darkness to you, how great is that darkness? The point is, the light is there. In all. The light shines through all things. That includes people. The very creations of God. This was easier to grasp than thinking, like, I didn't like the way you know, Christ is in all. That's, it's sometimes, you know, the Bible does point out that kind of bluntly. But in my background, that was a hard pill to swallow and hard wording to fit in my theology. But when I got to this part of seeing the light in all, suddenly I went, ah, there's another expression here to help me understand and move me closer, drag me into a greater, wider belief of the love of God that's bigger and better than what we've been told. 1 John 1, 9, three translations, the one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone. Are you kind of getting the picture here of everyone, all these terms? Yeah, yeah. There was the true light, or which enlightens every person coming into the world. Coming into the world enlightens every person. The day, a, a new day for humanity has come. The authentic light of life that illuminates everyone was about to dawn in the world. So you cannot throw out the word everyone and all like we have been taught to. Because this idea of conditional love, because we, we preach unconditional love, right? And yet, <laughs> we put conditions on it. <laughs> Hang on. Either it is unconditional or not. And I believe it is unconditional because the love of Christ is already shining through all things, all of creation, holding all things together, which we're going to get into. Last recap, I hope. Um, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even those who believe in his name. Huh. So there is value to belief. Absolutely. We're called to believe this reconciliation. 
So if somebody says, well, you don't have to believe then, well, you don't have to believe in order for it to be true. It's true whether you believe it or not. The beauty is when you start to believe the love of God for you and the reconciliation, you change. I change. And the best part of the change is happening to me, in my opinion, is my love for other people is growing. I'm losing the us versus them. And I'm so glad. I didn't know how heavy those weights were. The church is brutal when it comes to feeding separation thinking, dualism, us versus them. Don't hang out with those people because, you know, anyway. If you've grown up in church long enough, you understand that. And that's not just in church. That's in all kinds of places. So what happens if we're afraid? Oops, hang on. One last recap. No one has seen God at any time. This is really, really, really important. No one but Jesus. If we want to know who God is and what he's like, we don't go through the whole Bible and try and find it in the Old Testament. We go to Jesus first, then take him with us. Big difference. So what are you hearing? If what you're hearing is creating fear, consider this. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. 1 John 4, 18. Love wins. Ha! There it is. That's a home run. <laughs> All right. That was good scores. John 3.35. Now I can start my sermon. <laughs> Sorry. See, I told you it's all over the place, but I can't help it. To me, this is critical. Because <clears throat> we're asking, who is Jesus? Here it is. He's part of Trinity. The Father loved the Son and has given all things into his hand. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. So there is pure love between Father, Son, Spirit. We've had the illustration of three people coming up. It's COVID, we can't do it. But the idea is, you know, the person representing Jesus puts his hand on the person representing the Holy Spirit. Jesus loves the Spirit. Oh, that's awesome. And the Spirit loves Jesus. That's wonderful. Then we have God the Father, the person representing God the Father. Father puts his hand on the Spirit. The Father loves the Spirit. The Spirit puts his hand on the Father. Father, Spirit loves the Father. And then Jesus and the Father. It's like this trinity of love. <clears throat> Guess where we are? In it. You're in it, whether you like it or not. Just because you're blind and darkened to the truth of God's love for you does not mean that's not there or you're not in it. The love of God's critical. Okay, here it is. Brace yourself. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions, oh my goodness, or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Put that together with the light reference. To me, this is big. This is huge. If the light is in all things, we also have Jesus holding all things together. The very essence of the chairs you're sitting on, your, the makeup of your physical being, this building, the bricks, the mortar, the stand, the technology, the Wi-Fi, everything is being held together by Christ. If he were to cease holding something together, it would disappear. It would be gone. Therefore, if he holds all things together, he is close to everyone, whether they believe or not. This is an objective truth. Scientific truth, if you want to call it that. But here it is. Can, can anybody see the word <coughs> all in this passage? I hope so, because it's blunt. It's blatant. This is the Jesus I believe in. So to say you're separated from God because of your sins is bull crap. If you are, it's in your mind, and it's fake. 
You're not separated from Jesus, even though the little booklet track says so. It's wrong. You're connected to Jesus. His light shines through you. He wants you to believe the reconciliation has taken place. There's nothing you have to do. You get to respond. That's what you get to do. And you respond how? By believing. How do you do that? By the faith he gives you. What? What about my faith? You don't have any. Any faith you have is given to you by Christ. Oh, it sounds like it's all about him. Yeah. Imagine that. We're not human doings. We're human beings. Be in Christ. I'll say it again. Christ lives in you and he wants out. John 4, 18. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father as we, and we will be satisfied. Now, remember, Philip is... The relationship is good now. They're having a good conversation. So he thought, okay, now's my time to ask my question. If I'm going to ask the big one, here it is. Show us the Father. Give us the wowie zowie. And Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip? And yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone, anyone who has seen me has Seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father? And the Father is in me? Okay, you're hearing the Trinity now? I'm seeing it. The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the work you've seen me do. This is rich. This, to me, is so foundational. You want to know who the Father is? He's not that killing God in the Old Testament. He's the exact representation through Jesus. That's why the mirror translation is called the mirror translation. Because Jesus mirrors the Father accurately. And then we see ourselves in Christ as well. <clears throat> All right, another one. For in him, this is, this is the Apostle Paul speaking on Mars Hill. Remember, there's all these altars uh, around, that are, but there's one to the unknown God. And uh, he says, ah, I'm going to tell you guys about this God. And as he describes all this, he says, for in him we live, move, and exist. <clears throat> even as some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. He is talking about the, the oneness of all of our connections. That everyone is a child of God. Everyone. Well, what about other religions? What part of all don't you get? By the way, you want some mythology? For we are also all his children. That's like, uh, I think he's quoting Zeus. In the Bible? Yes. <laughs> Passion Translation says, It is through him that we live and function and have our identity. Just as your own poets have said, our lineage comes from him. Are you catching it? Same source. This Jesus is bigger than we were told. Much bigger and better. If whatever you're hearing or believing doesn't make Jesus bigger and better, I, I, I would question it. And questioning is great. You're allowed to. We need to. Colossians 1, 19 to 20. For it was the Father's, sorry, for it was the Father's God, uh, good pleasure, the Father God's good pleasure, however I wrote that, it doesn't look right. But anyway, uh, for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile some things to himself. Is that what it says? It was God's pleasure through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or in things in heaven, they have been reconciled. Okay, this is all. Are you catching the all word again? I hope so. Romans 5, 8 to 10. I'm sorry for all the verses, but I'm not making this up. And I want you to see what I see. I'm, I'm, I'm loving the do you see what I see. See, it's almost Christmas. Anyway, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, much 
more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Okay, this is a left hook. This is like a grand slam. I fit it in. <laughs> Honestly, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were reconciled while we were still sinners, so to speak. While we were still blind. Your little prayer didn't save you. Sorry, you're not that powerful. <laughs> Neither am I. Jesus took care of all this. And if we can see from the foundation of all that Jesus did, suddenly we realize, oh, I won't have to do these things in order to become or to maintain my sainthood or righteousness, I am already righteous. Now I get to live and be. Be who I already am. This is not performance acceptance. This is living from love. But Christ proved God's passionate love for us by dying in our place while we were still lost and ungodly. Before we said the prayer. <laughs> And there is still much more to say of his unfailing love for us. For through the blood of Jesus, we have heard the powerful declaration, you are now righteous in my sight. Ooh. And because of the sacrifice of Jesus, you'll never experience the wrath of God. Hmm. Almost done. So if while we were still enemies, God fully reconciled us to himself through the death of his son, then something greater than friendship is ours. Now that we are at peace with God, and because we share in his resurrection life, how much more will be rescued from sin's dominion? Wow. Reconciled. Exchanged. Are, are, are you hearing it? Is it going over your head? Am I making you go to sleep? Not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. King James Bible says, by whom we have now received the atonement, at one mint. The First Nations version says, but taking this a step further, we can now boast with glad hearts that what the great spirit has done through our honored chief creator sets free, Jesus, the chosen one. He is the one who has restored us back into friendship with the great spirit. This is not something that's going to happen. This is not what we tell people, that if you do this, then this is possible. It's already happened. Now believe it. 2 Corinthians 5.19, For God was in Christ reconciling those who pray the right prayer and believe the right doctrines. Nope. Reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Okay, now whose sins are not being counted against them? Answer out loud. Whose sins are not counted against them? Believers? Everyone! Then why are we so bent on judging in this world? Why is the church so judgmental of what we deem external sins and we don't even see our own in the mirror? It's already being taken care of and reconciled. Oh, to live from a place of forgiven and clean and righteous? Oh my goodness, the shackles and the weights that can fall off. But we're so used to control and judging and oh, because we got to be more right than the other person. 2 Corinthians 5.19, he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. Or Young's literal translation says, and having put in us the word of reconciliation. Mere translation says, God has placed this message in us. He now announces his friendship with every individual from within us. Ooh. And the great scripture, oh sorry, the great spirit was not holding people's broken ways against them. That's powerful. Instead, he was working in the chosen one to bring all people back into harmony with himself. He has now given us the honor of bringing this message to others. What is the message? The reconciliation has taken place. You are reconciled. Now believe it. I'm probably going to get some nasty emails, but too bad. But I understand how this can be hard to hear. 
especially when we've heard a conditional, prescribed salvation plan. When Jesus doesn't care about our little booklets. He's done it and declared it. He's asking us to believe it and then declare it. But it sounds so simple. Yeah, exactly. What does reconcile mean? To recreate friendly relationships, to make things compatible or consistent. Conciliation, the action of bringing peace and harmony, the action of ending strife. So if Jesus is the prince of peace, he's done it. He's brought peace. It's done. So where there was a problem with us as humanity having a relationship with God, look at Adam. He started it. And what did he do after he screwed up? Him and Eve, what did they do? Covered up. Oh, I'm a terrible person. Shame and uh, where are you hiding? Oh, Adam, oh, Eve, we're hiding over here. Like little kids do, right? <laughs> Can you imagine that? You yell at your little three-year-old, I'm hiding behind the counter. And you're like, just funny. But that's what happened here. And God says, why are you hiding? Did, whose perspective changed? Did God's perspective of Adam and Eve change when he walked into the garden? I think he knew exactly what happened. Of course not. He was on his way. I'm going to have fellowship with my kids. But Adam and Eve's mind changed. So there was a separation in their mind. There was something that destroyed the friendly relationship. And Jesus restores it. It's reconciled. Brought to account. (laughs) I hope you hear this. The one, the word, the revealer. Jesus is the word. He is the one. He is the revealer of truth. And he uses scripture. I think the scriptures are inspired to bring us hope. But sometimes we gloss over things or have been told certain things mean certain things, so we never question them again. Question it. There's more there. None of us know it all. Trust the spirit of peace in you. Because God is bigger and better than what we've been told. That I'm excited about. And for Hope Fellowship, I just want to keep drawing out what the scriptures say from multiple translations so you can see yourself and go, ah, I know it's there. Let's go find it. Let's dig in deeper. Let's, but it could lead to more questions, doesn't it? I'm sure there's many more questions. Wait a minute. If what you're saying is true, what about this? What about that? Exactly. Welcome to discipleship. Welcome to deconstruction, reconstruction. Deconstruction does not mean to destroy. And anything that's going to be dest- deconstructed in your thinking or teaching wasn't true anyway. So what are you afraid of? Huh. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life and his light shines through all let's pray heavenly father who be the revealer to us wake us up to see there's more of you available to our understanding that we can continue to grow in knowledge and understanding so that not only do we see you as bigger and better but we see our fellow humans as equals and full of your light May we see your light in others more quickly instead of judging. (laughs) May your peace guide us in this journey of revelation. Amen. All right. (sighs) That was a lot. Sorry. (laughs) It's one of those days. But, man, the content of what I'm sharing, obviously, I, I... I cannot share with you what I do not believe, and I cannot speak something that I do not agree with. I've had to wrestle with this, and it's been 30 years, different stages of growth. Brian Abel, good morning. He waves hello. And John, Brenda, and Kitchener, good morning. And Gordon Melville, great to see you all online. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thanks for being here in person. It does make it a little more fun (laughs) and interactive instead of just in front of my screen, which works, but this is so much nicer. And if you want to join us next Sunday in person, just uh, register online at the Hope Fellowship website. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today.